Hi, my name is Barry Borlaug. I'm a cardiologist at Mayo Clinic here in Rochester, Minnesota. I'd like to talk with you briefly today about the evaluation of patients with exertional dyspnea. We all know this is a very common problem that we all face in the clinics and on the wards, both in cardiology practices and in general internal medicine or family practice practices. The differential boils down to conditions such as obesity, pulmonary disease, anemia, uh, sometimes just deconditioning, or heart failure. Now, we know there's two forms of heart failure, systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That's pretty easy to diagnose. You just get an echocardiogram and demonstrate a low ejection fraction and you're done. It's not so straightforward though in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. If patients show clear-cut evidence of congestion on physical exams, such as jugular distension, or have other laboratory or echocardiographic markers, like elevated levels of natriuretic peptides or other echo Doppler findings, it often is pretty easy to reach the diagnosis. But we've seen that many of these patients do not display elevation in BNP levels and have relatively normal echocardiograms. And in these patients, it can be very challenging to reach the diagnosis. We've shown that invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which we perform in our laboratory on a daily basis, functions as a gold standard test. Cardiac failure can be defined by an inability of the heart to pump blood to the body at a rate commensurate with its needs, or to do that pumping only at the cost of high filling pressures. In the cath lab, we were able to measure the pumping function, looking at cardiac output, and measure the filling pressures directly, both at rest and during exercise, allowing us to reach a definitive diagnosis to either rule in the cause or equally effectively rule out heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as a cause of breathlessness. We are able to identify a number of other contributors such as exercise-induced pulmonary vascular hypertension, as well as problems in the periphery and skeletal muscles such as mitochondrial myopathies. It's an invasive test, but it's quite, quite safe. And we found that it, in many circumstances, it's often cheaper than performing multiple serial tests which in the end do not allow for definitive diagnosis, and a lot of these patients end up in the catheterization laboratory anyway. It's important to stress that diagnosis would otherwise be impossible in the majority of these patients, and many patients with HFPEF or without HFPEF find great solace just in reaching the diagnosis and uh, allowing us to move forward and consider other treatment options for whatever diagnosis we establish. Thank you for your time.